a lot of things are going to happen very quick. I heard those words as I was being rolled feet first into an emergency trauma department. I had just taken a calamitous fall backwards off the edge of the Lincoln Memorial. I had bounced twice on the marble ledges. I remember a rescuer on horseback, and I remember the sound of a siren from inside an ambulance. And I remember that on arrival at the hospital, there was a crowd of professionals waiting, and one of them leaned down very close to my face and said, a lot of things are going to happen very quickly now. I did not know at that time if I was going to live or die. I was just trying to breathe. And that warning actually had a marvelous effect on me. It allowed me to just focus on taking it breath by breath while all the chaos was going on. And that warning has been kind of like a lighthouse to me ever since. And it is why I'm here with you to give you a little warning that a lot of things are going to happen very quickly. And that day they did for me. I was stripped and prodded and scanned. And all I did was breathe one breath at a time. And I am still breathing. And uh, the, that day, when, I was, when all this was going on, I, I was thinking about what I would, I was thinking about death. I was thinking about whether I would, whether I would survive. But I healed up and I decided to, well, actually, I healed up just in time for the pandemic. And that's important here where things went really slow. <clears throat> and during the pandemic, I decided that I would adopt a new principle for me called death positivity. Death positivity is facing death dead on, directly. Death positivity means that we accept death and we plan for death and we talk about it because yes, we are all going to die and Talking about it won't kill us. Talking about it might help. So after the lockdown, I was going to make that my mission. And then I got really, really deathy. I became a end-of-life doula. An end-of-life doula, or also it called a death doula, is someone who helps people to plan for and experience a better death. I also volunteered in my new city of Washington, D.C. to sit with people who were ending their life alone, holding hands with people. I got very involved. I joined things. I, well, as you know, I throw myself off things. And my wardrobe became very velvet focused. I remember I was really, really into this. Um, and it felt really great. I was talking about death all the time. I was talking to death with it, talking about death with anyone who was interested and some who were not. And I even became the death doula of, in residence at Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C., also called the hippest cemetery in America. And there I was able to help hold gatherings where we would do, as I mentioned, we would accept death, we would plan for death, and we would talk about death. And it was hugely popular the press was interested, the public was interested, people contacted me from all over the world to talk about their experiences with death, very, very existential conversations. People invited me to their deathbeds. I have not had small talk in years. It was great. So much death positivity, so much talk of death, but then a lot of things began to happen very quickly. It got personal. Two of the matriarchs in my life died. Muriel and Francine. And that was really hard. I noticed something that they both did, though. They both, when they knew that they were dying, they both called their friends and family. And they said, thank you. I love you. And goodbye. And that is death positive. And I was really impressed. 
My mother was not impressed. My mother is in her 80s, and she is losing people rapidly in her life. And she did not think that this was a very good idea. She rolled her eyes at my death-positive nonsense, and she declared herself death negative. <laughs> Absolutely fair, because my mother is very busy. <laughs> my mother is very busy, and she does not have time to stop for death. But the deaths kept coming. My cousins, two of my cousins, died around that time in my own generation. Tragic deaths. And I got on a plane for the first time since the pandemic. I flew to California to go to an ash scattering under the Golden Gate Bridge as my grandma deaths. And no lie just said anything about any sort of death positivity. Especially me. And back in D.C., as a new death doula, the people that I had been meeting who were dying were becoming people who had died. And I was still reached by more and more people with very difficult existential questions about death. Because I missed death probably. It was a lot of death. There was a lot of loss. I saw hundreds of dying people. I saw good deaths, uh, you know, well, well grand, well cared for deaths. I saw death with a lot of chaos. And I saw deaths that had unnecessary suffering. And so while I'm alone, my stamina already started to get a little uncomfortable. I felt like I, it, was, it was inappropriate for me to be in public sometimes. I felt like people should want to be around me. All this stuff started to make me feel very uncomfortable and unwelcome. And I started to wonder whether this was something that I could keep doing. It is no longer theoretical. And there was... And then I met someone. Um, I, it, uh, I met someone who changed so much of this for me very, very soon. Hoff, as he is liking now. Hoff, uh, more dusty than me. <laughs> more that caught to there had a longer scholarship in these issues, and also had a sense of humor about it. And I scorely did him. And the first day that we met, we were chat, chat, chat. And he encouraged me in my projects, I encouraged him in his. And uh, I think our families were very relieved that we were had each other to chat about all this morbid stuff. So years before I met him, Hop had created a three-hour musical playlist to be played at his own future deathbed. He was not ill. He was prepared. And his, his playlist was so death positive. I said, let's have a gathering at the cemetery. A lot of people will get together. We'll all listen to your playlist. It was Woodstock heading as he was actually air. And we would listen to his music and we would create our own transition playlists. We sent a date. He never arrived because Robert Hoff Hoffman died. There's only one person that I can talk to about that, and I can't talk to him. I would like to say, Hoff, this death positivity stuff is stupid. It is hard, and it is exhausting, and I think maybe we should just live in the present and not think always. But I asked the gentleman, Hoff, and would laugh at me. He would say, hey, Get back to work because it's not about him and it's not about me, certainly. And the idea of death positivity is not living forever. It is living while you're alive. And he did. But now I must tell you something yeah, that happened. We must tell you this thing that happened very quickly because it was from Kevin Around the same time, a little boy two years old, named Artemis, was carried into an emergency room. But he did not survive. Artemis was killed by a medical sake. He was plucked from his loving family and his healthy life and stimulate his cast into the sea 
of loss. I cannot overstate how close this family is to ours and how personal this is. But it affects so many people. This one child, his parents, his family, his community. There is no place for death positivity when we're talking about someone's child. That is an absurd notion. To uh, accept, to to plan for, to talk about it. We cannot accept it. We cannot plan for it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit that we can talk about Arnon's. We can talk about children that are lost. His name was Artemis. A lot of things were happening in Gerdekakon. I thought death positivity would make things easier. But if that's it, it is now the hack for avoiding loss and pain and fear and anger. We all still die. Death positive people die. Children die. I live in a city with high infant mortality. I carry Narcan in my purse because of the level of overdoses. Violent death is like a weather report that we think we have no influence over. And people around us are being robbed of years of life on layers of inequity and lack of access. And death positivity doesn't make any of that easier. But maybe the easy part is when I head wrong. Death positivity doesn't make it easier. But I find it to be a superpower of courage in the face of our mortality. Because death denial is a choice, and every time I choose not to look away, I can do good in the world. And it turns out I'm good at it. I have courage with talking about death. I have courage when I'm with dying people and with the bodies of people who have died. I have courage with caregivers and mourners. I cannot make you be brave too and to have courage here, but I can recommend incorporating a little bit of death positivity into your daily lives. Why? Because a lot of things happen very quickly in life, and death denial is a lonely state of mind. And death positivity is a kind of game one, because I help people make end of life plans. I don't make it easier. I make it possible. And I don't make it less painful and try to make it more loving. You too can have the difficult conversations before death is on the home. You can talk about death. You can talk about your own death. You can tell your people that you love them and where the passwords are. A lot of people in our society die alone or surrounded by, by frightened caregivers because we are so afraid of death and dying people. And none of that has to be true. We can all do more. We can show up. And we can all care more about the preventable causes of early death. Now there's time to take action. I cannot promise it will be easier. Death is not positive. Does not negative either. It's indifferent. It is us. We, the living, can choose whether we will avoid or we will connect. I do not know how many more breaths I've got. I know that they are finite and they are precious, and that I want to make them matter. Because a lot of things are happening. And this moment is one of that. Thank you.